As the world gets more dangerous, is America's military up to the challenge? Russia is eating our lunch. Hear why some experts fear we are not ready for the next war. The rest of the world did not slow down. Then, a second battle with cancer. This thing could kill me now. And one desperate prayer. There's nothing I can do. I have to gut this thing out. His miraculous survival. I mean, how much more blessed can you be? On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Republicans have won the most expensive congressional election in history. Democrats from across the country spent more than $30 million to take away a seat in Georgia, but it still wasn't enough. It's a victory for the White House as well as Democrats made the race a referendum on President Trump. Caitlin Burke brings us the story. A boost for the Trump base coming out of Georgia Tuesday night, as Republican Karen Handel kept another House seat firmly in the hands of the GOP. Tonight's victory, it's for you, and it's for every single citizen in the 6th District. It's for every single person with a dream. And a special thanks to the President of the United States of America. The battle to win the seat left vacant by Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price smashed House race spending records. Democrats, including many from outside Georgia, along with Republicans, poured more than $50 million into the campaign. Attack ads flooded the airwaves of the Atlanta suburbs. John Ossoff and his liberal allies have... Democratic candidate John Ossoff ran as a moderate, with some saying he was trying to look like a Republican. Democrats saw an opening for a win in the district after Trump only won its support in the presidential election by one and a half percent. So this is not the outcome any of us were hoping for. But this is the beginning of something much bigger than us. Democrats have been trying to win a special election since their loss in the race for the White House, hoping to show that the public is turning against the Trump administration. So far, they've failed in every attempt. President Trump was quick to react to Handel's victory, tweeting, things are looking great for Karen H. House Speaker Paul Ryan said in a statement, quote, Democrats from coast to coast threw everything they had at this race, and Karen would not be defeated. <laughs> Special elections aren't necessarily good predictors of the following year's congressional elections, but after yet another disappointment for Democrats, it may be time for soul-searching and finger-pointing. Heading into the 2018 midterm elections, Democrats need to pick up 24 House seats to take back the majority. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, it's now 4-0 and oh for President Trump in these special elections. He keeps on winning, uh, and it looks like we're going to have a lot of uh, blockbuster elections coming up. It seems like the cycle never ends, but here we are once again in, in yet another election cycle. Well, in other news, the controversial winner of a previous special congressional election is being sworn into office today. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. Montana's Greg Gianforte made national headlines after a physical altercation with a reporter at the end of his campaign, raising questions about his suitability for office. So our Abigail Robertson traveled to the big sky country to find out what Montanans think of their new congressman. On May 24th, the day before Montana voters went to the polls, it looked like smooth sailing for Greg Gianforte to win the state's sole congressional seat. And then... I'm sick and tired of you guys! The last time you came here, you did the same thing! Gianforte still won the election by 6%, with about 37% of eligible voters casting their ballots before the incident occurred. Prior to running for office, he was well known around the state, as a successful businessman, generous philanthropist, and strong Christian, which made his actions shocking to many who know him well. We were shocked. Uh, there are many political candidates in Montana who, if you heard a story like that, you wouldn't be surprised that it happened. But with Greg, we were all surprised because that, that's simply out of character for him. Greg, I've known for almost 20 years, that's just not what I've ever ever seen of him. When Pastor Hughes first heard about the incident, he thought it was a hoax. And then he saw an email from Gianforte saying an unfortunate event took place and he wanted to talk. He called and he just, uh, his, I think one of his first comments was, Brian, uh, you know, as my pastor, I just want you to know 
I did not glorify God in my actions, but I sure hope to and long to glorify God in my response going forward. What do you think happened a couple weeks ago? I think what happened was after 22 months of campaigning for governor and then for congressman, I think the, the whole pressure, all of the feeling, you know, man, I've been drugged through the mud and all of that, I think he just snapped and he obviously regrets it immensely. Hughes says he's prayed with Gianforte a few times about how to best handle the situation. I really was confident that Greg would take responsibility, take ownership and do whatever he had to do to make things right and, and uh, seek to honor the Lord yeah. in it and moving forward. He believes supporters should acknowledge what happened was unacceptable, but he can still be forgiven. Unfortunately, there were some in the state who, you know, on social media who were almost excusing or justifying, saying, well, you know, the press does this and the they got what they deserved. And, all. and so our elders felt like, no, we don't, we don't want to be, we don't want anyone to assume that's our attitude toward it, nor is it Greg's. While there were reports of some early voters trying to change their vote, many still have confidence in Gianforte. In downtown Bozeman, Several people were reluctant to speak on camera, but say they still support him. And others say they have just as many questions of the media as they do of Gianforte. I'm not sure the, uh, how much of it was made up and how much of it wasn't, you know. But, uh, you know, I feel like it was over-exaggerated by the press a tiny bit. I think these politicians and political figures get sort of harassed by the press sometimes, so it's not entirely shocking but still pretty, I mean, a shameful thing. There is a diminished effect of the media pursuing public figures as much as they do. Uh, fewer and fewer people are going to get involved. The jury's still out on whether he can move past this. I don't think Montana's going to approve of how he works in the House, and I don't think Montana approved of how he behaved the last week of his campaign. Gianforte has about 16 months to prove himself as a congressman and try to put this incident behind him before he's up for re-election in 2018. Reporting from Montana, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. The Prime Minister of Belgium says a terrorist attack his country thwarted could have led to serious injuries. A soldier shot and killed a suspect after a small explosion at a busy train station in Brussels. It was the latest in a week of attacks in capitals across Europe. Authorities found a suitcase bomb filled with gas bottles and nails. One witness described the man as very agitated, saying he was yelling about jihadists and shouted Allahu Akbar, which is Arabic for God is great. Then he blew up something on a baggage trolley. The 36-year-old suspect was a Moroccan citizen who lived in Brussels. Reuters reports he had not been suspected of possible militant links. Well, President Trump's son-in-law, White House senior advisor Jared Kushner, arrives in Israel today. He joins an official U.S. negotiator for meetings with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the visit is the latest attempt to forge a peace agreement between the Israelis and Palestinians. Listening and learning from Israelis and Palestinians, that's what Israel's defense minister says the Trump administration is doing. They're proceeding cautiously, uh, as should be, listening to all parties in the region, trying to find out what's realistic, as opposed to the top-down uh, tactics of the Obama administration, which sought to impose a preconceived notion on Israel in particular and on the Palestinians as well. Trump's recent Middle East visit shows he wants to include Middle East Sunni nations in a regional peace plan, yet it might have limitations. Clearly the atmospherics in the region have improved and the Israelis and the Saudis in particular have a common enemy in Iran. Is that going to play into Palestinian and Israeli negotiations in the way many people are hoping? I'm not sure. David Weinberg sees a big difference between the Trump and Obama administrations. The Obama administration took to hectoring Israel all the time, uh, berating Israel. Trump has taken a different approach. Work with Israel, see what's realistic, and time to give the Palestinians a dose of reality as well. Part of that reality included reports President Trump shouted at Abbas in their recent meeting in Bethlehem. 
The president reportedly accused the PA leader of lying to him at the White House when he said the Palestinians are raising their children to live in peace with Israel, while official Palestinian media shows just the opposite. A White House official cautioned that an historic peace agreement would take time, so expect more visits here to Israel by Middle East negotiators Kirshner and Greenblatt. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Gordon, this has been an elusive deal for many. Do you think President Trump will have a better shot at it? Well, the Bible says peace, peace, and there is no peace. You, you, you look at it and say, I hope they can get something done. You know, you go back to Khartoum, and that was the, the Arab conference right after the Six-Day War, and the Arab nations all came up with the famous three no's, no negotiation with Israel, uh, no, no peace with Israel, and you, you, you just say, can it happen with the Palestinian Authority? Here you have a culture that is bent on destroying Israel. Uh, they're bent on a right of return, and they're not just talking about the West Bank. They're not talking about just East Jerusalem. They're talking about Jaffa. They're talking about Haifa. They're talking about Tel Aviv. So they want to wipe Israel off the map. That's what they've been taught since they were young. Uh, they have streets named after terrorists. They have city squares named after terrorists. Uh, they glorify them as martyrs for the faith. Uh, how can you ever get to a peace agreement with them? But uh, many administrations have tried. Uh, we'll see if on this one. I, I doubt they'll. I'll doubt they'll come to some very key terms. What about the Temple Mount? And what about the right of return? Those two things uh, will will make any peace agreement elusive. If you want to understand today's headlines, you need to get the history, and we've made it easy for you. We have a documentary on the Six-Day War called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem, and it's the authentic history. There's no made-up dialogue here. It's all based on the actual recollections of the soldiers who participated in the battle, who stood on the Temple Mount and said to the world, the Temple Mount is in our hands. When you understand what happened, particularly from 1948 to 1967, you'll understand today's headlines. I want you to have it at yours for a gift of $15. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. Wendy? Up next, America's military might is in decline. Our equipment and materiel has just been worn out by years of war. If we're talking about electronic warfare, Russia is eating our lunch. See what's keeping top brass awake at night when we come back. It only took five minutes for a hacker to break into the Pentagon's computer network through an Army recruitment website. The good news is that it wasn't a real security attack. It was a public demonstration to help expose the military's vulnerabilities. And as John Jessup explains, those weaknesses are symptoms of a much larger problem for the military. It's falling behind in developing the technology for modern weapons. Dramatic provocations from North Korea and saber rattling in Russia and Iran are prompting the United States to break out its military might. That show of force includes firing cruise missiles into Syria, dropping the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan, moving aircraft carriers to the Korean Peninsula, and the latest, a successful missile defense test. Yet, even with these apparent wins, defense experts are worried about America's military weaknesses. Does this stuff keep you up at night? It does keep me up, but more importantly, it keeps up Pentagon leadership at night. What worries top brass the most threats across multiple fronts. That's the challenge right now. What we're optimized to handle is sort of the Cold War environment, where you have a singular threat. War in the 21st century no longer relies on conventional weapons and strategy. If we're talking about electronic warfare, Russia is eating our lunch. Mackenzie Eaglin studies defense strategy for the American Enterprise Institute. She told CBN News the military lost its edge with the long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Here we are winding down from the wars of the last decade and finding that the rest of the world did not slow down. In fact, they're catching up or surpassing us. How much are you concerned about lack of resources, outdated equipment, or not having enough equipment? Very much so. 
and, and, and it's exacerbated by the fact that we've been at war for 15 years. So a lot of our equipment and material has just been worn out. Yeah. It's been worn out by years of war. Some of it to the point that it's not even worth bringing it home. While the U.S. spends more than any other country on defense, the amount has dropped by 20 percent since 2010 due to spending caps mandated by law. Meanwhile, China and Russia have only increased their military spending. We also have to be a little bit nervous when their budget is growing 10 to 20 billion every year and ours is coming down 20 to 30 billion every year. President Trump wants to change that with a multi-billion dollar increase for the Pentagon. Though well, many say it's not enough. $54 billion is not going to fix the problems of a military that's already been shrunk to pre-World War II levels. But it's a good start. A lot of the root of our degradation of capabilities comes from budget uncertainty. So making sure that we can put a budget deal together that gives the military the ability to future plan in the long term will also uh, really support long-term capabilities. Experts and defense hawks both agree the cuts have hurt the military in more areas than troop levels and hardware. Eaglin points to China, which has taken the lead in next generation space and missile technology. It includes the development of hypersonic missiles that travel more than a mile per second. Army commanders call them a game changer and acknowledge it would be nearly impossible to defend against them. Another loss in leadership? research and development. In the past, military ideas drove commercial revolution within the American economy, giving the public the internet, GPS, mobile phones, and more. Everything from plastic bags to pantyhose are from the U.S. military or derivative from research and development. Uh, the federal government is no longer the driver in research and development in our U.S. economy. It is now led by the commercial sector. And the problem with that is, if the Defense Department wants access to it, everybody has access to it. That means the military must now line up with everyone else to learn from the business world, using products like tablets for airstrikes and Xbox controllers for drones. All of this paints a disaster scenario, as was recently illustrated by a former Pentagon planner. In a series of 16 different war games designed to see whether the U.S. and NATO could defend the Baltic states against Russia, the U.S. lost every one. So what does all of this mean for the U.S. military? Analysts say the loss of technological advantage will lead to failed missions, higher casualties, and longer wars. It's a gap the U.S. must fill now before it's too late. John Jessup, CBN News, Washington. That's an excellent report, but we're facing a situation with our budget. How much military can we afford? And you look at the ongoing battles in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's been the largest, longest engagement in our nation's history. Uh, and how can we continue to, to pay for it? Uh, you look at our budget deficit and we're running up trillions of de dollars in deficit money. Uh, at what point in time do, can we no longer even afford a military? There was a study done by, the, uh, by Bank of America, not exactly a, a liberal think tank or a conservative think tank, uh, it's just a bank, and they said if you eliminate all discretionary spending from the federal uh, budget, eliminate all of it, get rid of all of it, you still don't balance the budget. So that is a, an incredible fact, and we, we need to wake up. How much money can we afford? Uh, how can we continue to spend like there's no tomorrow. Wendy? Well, coming up, a man suffers excruciating pain after cancer surgery. From the day I left the hospital, I had sharp pains, burning, spasms. If you know what a Charlie horse feels like in your leg, imagine that deep inside your chest. And they would go on for three to five minutes. See how this man's pain vanishes in an, excuse me, in an instant when we come back. Joseph Marks had already beat cancer once when it returned a second time with a vengeance. The radical surgery it required left him in tremendous pain and at the absolute lowest point in his life. Joseph Marks is a retired Navy man, husband and father. In 2013, he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer and successfully treated with chemo and radiation. But when the tumor returned two years later, surgery was the only option. This was devastating to me. It attacks your faith in, in a way that I never imagined. 
Now I'm gonna have to go through the surgery. This thing could kill me now. This time, this is a more advanced cancer. The tumor was removed, but when complications followed, the only recourse was to implant a stent in his esophagus to try to heal the damage. From the day I left the hospital, I had sharp pains, burning, spasms. If you know what a Charlie horse feels like in your leg, imagine that deep inside your chest, and they would go on for three to five minutes. These muscles are being expanded, they're tearing, and the nerves are um, damaged, and it was the most excruciating pain in my life. Joseph was bedridden and unable to eat. I can't even bring myself to feed myself. It's every two to three minutes I'm going into a spasm. And I'm like, there's nothing I can do. I have to gut this thing out. I will say that I've never been in despair in my life, but th this was probably the lowest point of my entire life. One morning, Joseph turned on the television and began watching the 700 Club. I'm desperate and I need, I need someone to pray for me. I'm on my knees, I got my hands out, and I'm just like, Lord, please hear my, hear my cry. And there's Pat, the he goes, there's somebody that has like tumors in the esophagus. You've got tumors in your esophagus. I don't know if you burned it or whether it's a fungus, but uh, they're like tumors. When he said that, I started weeping. I said, there's my answer to my prayer. God, God is answering. Everything he's saying, it, I mean, he's just saying this really, it's just happening so quick. Right now, God, you'll feel like a, like a hot breath of air is just burning through uh, your esophagus and God is healing you right now. I felt warm all over my body, not just right in here, but I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit come upon me. And um, after he got, I was just weeping and weeping like I haven't wept, I think ever, but it was joy because it was, my, it was my, a moment of deliverance. And when he got done, the pain was gone. That was it. No more spasms. Joseph has been pain-free ever since. The stent was removed, and 10 months after surgery, there is no sign of cancer. He's returned to his active lifestyle with a grateful heart and a newfound peace. I see how God has, has done some things in my heart. And that's what I've, I've learned is that, that, that Hebrew word, that shalom, that sense of being not just at, at being peace in your life, but it's a deepness of understanding of your well-being, where your standing is with the Lord. And I don't have cancer. I'm feeling better. I start seeing, I start seeing some future to my life again. I mean, how much more blessed can you be? Amen. How much more blessed you can, can you be? Well, what happened to him can happen to you. God is no respecter of persons. God is a healer. And uh, we've got some praise reports, Gordon. Here's one from um, John of Sheridan, Indiana. He's had problems with his lower jaw bones since he was a young boy. Last September, he was watching the 700 Club and he heard you give a word of knowledge, Gordon, saying someone you, you have a recurring condition in the bone in your jaw. It's primarily in the lower jaw. Your teeth are loose as a result of this bone condition and deterioration. You're looking at grafts. You're looking at surgical procedures and God is able. He's working a miracle for you right now in Jesus' name. He's able to restore bone. He's able to take away all the infection and make everything normal again. Just receive it now in Jesus' name. Well, John received that word. The pain stopped. He's had no pain since that day. Yay. Here's Janet from Texas. Suffered from fibromyalgia for seven and a half years. The doctor said, it's one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Mm. Well, she was watching the 700 Club. We have the date, May 11th, <laughs> 2017. Wendy said, people that have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, with chronic fatigue, that is a spiritual problem most of the time. Start putting the praise music, music on. Start praising God. God is going to deliver you as you worship and thank Him. That spirit will leave in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, Janet accepted the word and felt an immediate difference, and she is completely healed. Amen. Realize that God inhabits the praise of His people. When you come to him with thanksgiving for what he has already done, believe that you have already received it. That's the key to miracles. Believe that you have already received it. These are the words of Jesus. You'll find them in Mark chapter 11. Believe that you have already received it. So, when were your sins forgiven? Start thinking about that. 
Oh, they were forgiven before you even born, before that you even committed them. Mm -hmm. They were forgiven on the cross 2,000 years ago. When were all your diseases healed? Same time, 2,000 years ago. He's borne away all our sickness, all our pain, all of it. So let's bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who heals all your diseases, who forgives all your iniquity. Let's come to him right now. Let's believe. Let's thank him for what he's already done. And let's see it happen in your body right now. Let's pray. Amen. Lord, we just come to you and we just lift the needs to you. And we come boldly to the throne of grace and we ask that your grace would be poured out, that you would yes. just open eyes, open ears, that they may hear you that they may know you and they may know the greatness of, the, of your power towards us who believe. Yes, Lord. So stretch forth your hand to do miracles today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone you've got um, been diagnosed with um, cancer in the right lung uh, and you're feeling sensations in that lung right now. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, it's like there's um, uh, just uh, fingers, hands going into your lung right now and just taking all that cancer away. In Jesus' name, be healed. That pain, uh, be healed. Be gone now in Jesus' name. All of the phlegm, all of, all of the, the difficulty in breathing, all of the coughing, all of that, gone. Now, take a deep breath, what you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. Take a deep breath and realize God just healed healed you. Wendy, what do you have? Yeah, there's a woman you've been praying for many years for deliverance from chronic migraines. Today's the day of your deliverance. God has heard your prayers. He's delivering you. Just start praising God. You are healed. They're not coming back. Thank you, Lord. Uh, there's someone you've got a problem with hearing in your right ear, and it's related to ear infections, uh, and you're experiencing pain in that ear. In Jesus' name, be healed. Yes. Be made whole. All of that just disappear and go away. Yes. Uh, someone else with problems with your um, pelvis and, and hip. Uh, it's like it's tilted and it's causing a, a limp. In Jesus' name, everything be restored, be made whole. There's other people that you saw the story about uh, the man healed from the esophagus issues and you, you're having, um, there's someone else with a problem with their esophagus. There's a hole in it. God is healing that. It's, it's healing being, God is touching you right now. Just receive it in Jesus name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done, how you gave yourself so that we could be with you. We thank you for all that you've done in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. If you've been healed, we want to know. We want to share your good report, your testimony. So call us 1 800 700 7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you 24 hours a day. There's a reason. There's the prayer of the importune widow, that parable in the New Testament. There's a reason for it. Jesus encourages us to keep praying, keep, prom keep holding on to that promise. So we're here for you for that. All you have to do is call us 1 800. 700, 7,000. Wendy? All right, well, coming up, a family's boat business is headed for the rocks. We were producing 18 boats a week, and we went down to three boats a week. We were rock bottom, and it was devastating. See what got this couple's boat business back afloat later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A massive cross that stood in a Florida park for nearly a half century is being removed. A federal judge ruled in favor of the American Humanist Association. The secularist group filed a lawsuit last year on behalf of four people. A local paper, the Pensacola News Journal, reports two of them have moved to Canada since the case began. The suit claimed the 34-foot monument violated the Constitution and was offensive to non-Christians. The city now has 30 days to remove it from Bayview Park in Pensacola. The judge said he was aware that there was a lot of support for keeping the cross as is, but said the law is the law 
although he also added he hopes the Supreme Court will revisit its view on judging such cases. Well, people here in Washington will soon be able to get gender-neutral licenses. Instead of only M for male and F for female, transgender people will be able to choose X on their licenses representing their gender-neutral identity. The licenses will be available as early as next Monday. Washington, D.C. is the second jurisdiction in the country to offer this option. The state of Oregon moved to offer gender-neutral licenses beginning July 3rd. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Today, Bill and Lana Hughes own the number one boat business in the Pacific Northwest. But several years ago, they feared their business might be going under. That's when Lana cried out to God for help, and he answered big time. The Hughes family of Colville, Washington, have been making high-quality fishing boats for almost 70 years. Owners Bill and Lana Hughes credit their company's success to family and faith. Our priority is to honor God first. That hasn't always been easy. Bill and Lana have tithed off their personal income since 2007. But that decision was tested when the economy slid into a recession and people cut back on luxury items like boats. By 2009, their family business was in trouble. The first thing we did as owners was take a 25% cut in pay. We were producing 18 boats a week and we went down to three boats a week. The company was forced to lay off dozens of employees, but it was still running a deficit, so 80 more were let go. Later, the Hughes discovered that an employee had stolen from the company and defrauded them out of $1 million. As we did the financials, we realized that that loss is why we had to do the 80 people layoff, and it was devastating. Through it all, the Hughes were faithful and continued tithing but they knew they needed a miracle to save their company. We were rock bottom and we prayed, God, we're gonna give you, you pull us out of this, you help us, you direct us, you give us the wisdom we need to turn this around. And if not, give us the wisdom to know what to do next. And it wasn't 24 hours later before things started turning around. Things that had to be God. They also noticed an immediate upswing in their business. Money would come in unexpectedly. As God blessed them, the Hughes increased their giving to ministries such as CBN. They have a worldwide mission that makes me feel like I'm helping. I like to know that we're helping here at home in the United States, but we're also helping in other countries and around the world as God has asked us all to do. Since that time, Hughes Marine Company has posted nearly $20 million in sales. They also hired back some of their workers and now have 133 employees. We're the first boat business to pull up out of the recession. Since then, our business has been number one in the Pacific Northwest. Two years ago, we finished a 20,000 foot expansion on the building and became debt free at the same time. The Hughes say putting God first was the key to their success. God blessed the business so much, we literally paid off the debt for the expansion before the bank even finished paperwork. I see the world now as the sky's the limit, you know? If, if we're doing what God wants us to do, nothing's gonna hold us back. You can't outgive God, the Hughes figured that out. Well, if you would like to invest in something with, that's good ground, CBN is that place. The number on your screen, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to cbn.com and just say yes, I want to give. It's just 65 cents a day. $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBN partner. When you do that, we have a very special gift for you right now. It's Pat Robertson's latest teaching called Miracles. Experience God's power in your own life. If you need a miracle or you know somebody who does, you need to get this. These stories will blow your mind. They are absolutely incredible and will build your faith. So, Hey, we want you to go to your phones right now. We need your help. Uh, if you want to help people all over the world, it's so easy, and we're going to send you miracles um, just for you. So, Gordon? Well, up next, meet the man who's making God's voice heard without making a sound. The Lord spoke to me very clearly about starting to put the words of Jesus on the buses in London. Howard Condor, the founder of Revelation TV, talks about his, quote, Jesus campaign. 
right after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. As a young man, Howard Condor had a successful career in the music industry. By the age of 23, he had a Rolls Royce and an Aston Martin. Many years later, for his most recent project, Howard has focused on London city buses. Take a look. Howard Condor is the founder of Revelation TV, a Christian television network in the UK. With political correctness silencing the church in Europe, Howard came up with a plan to make God's voice heard without making a sound. The Lord spoke to me very clearly about starting to put the words of Jesus on the buses in London. Through the Quote Jesus campaign, scripture can now be seen on buses all over the city. Howard hopes the message spreads throughout London and all over Europe. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, Howard Condor, and it's great to have you here. Thank you, Gordon. You're so kind. Give, give me an idea, give, give the audience, give me an idea of what it's like to be a Christian in England today. Uh, persona non gratis. Uh, it's something which, uh, even within the hierarchy, you know, if a politician, for example, had to resign last week, uh, one of our main politicians, the leading party, the Liberal Party, uh, because he was a born again Christian, believed in scripture, but was hounded by the press uh, through the campaign that we had, the election campaign. Mm -hmm. And eventually he said, look, the two will never uh, meet, especially in our country. Now, in America, you've, you've got the privilege of having uh, great men of, and women of God in, in politics, and we don't have that anymore. They've cut us out. We're a subspecies. Well, I, I like to tell people in America, look to Europe, and, and it's like looking forward in time. What, what can happen to us, and well, what, do you, what do you think is the cure for England? For them to know the words of the Lord um, and to read the Bible uh, as I did when I was, well, 50 years ago now, when I was 21. Mm -hmm. It changed my life. It will change anybody's life. But if the words of God uh, are not made known, they're not going to switch on to Christian television, most people. They're not going to uh, walk into a church, uh, not many. You know, and yet six and a half million people have seen the quotes of Jesus in just a few months. God right. knew what he was doing when he started this. Well, let's, let's start, let's talk about the campaign because I think it's wonderful. I think you're getting the words of Jesus out to, to everyone. And how did it start? What, what was the genesis of the idea? Uh, at the end of each year, I always ask the Lord what he wants me to do next year because uh, I want to be fresh and I want to don't want to carry on in the same old thing. You know? mm -hmm. And the Lord said to me, and this is unusual, because it doesn't happen every day or even every year, but it was almost as if he was sitting next to me and he told me about this campaign and this idea of putting the words of Jesus on the buses. I thought, wow, this is incredible. What a clever idea. Because it cuts across the political correctness atmosphere. It means that the quotes of Jesus, because he's a historical person, like Shakespeare, Shakespeare's words are all over the buses, why not quotes from Jesus? People who walk around the streets, the six, uh, six and a half million people actually every day travel on the buses, 10 million people in the city working and living, and 17 million people coming to visit London. Was it easy for you? It was easier because the Lord gave me the strategies. Uh -huh. um, but we did have a setback a couple of weeks ago where when the terrorist attack happened in Manchester, we wanted suddenly to send a message of hope to those in Manchester. And I wanted uh, the scripture, for example, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And it was turned down by th two or three of the bus companies. And anyway, one of them is uh, retorted and they've given us that. I and mean, it starts this week. And so we, um, I pushed the boat out a little bit more, took more buses, and I said, I want three more uh, two more scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> How are you measuring the impact of this? If six and a half million people are seeing the words of Jesus on a daily basis, this, well, so it's how, how do you measure that? Well, it was a stat which we pushed for from the advertising agencies because they have to go to people like Burberry and all the big names that normally advertise or the big films, mm. and they have to give them something. And they said they worked it out that uh, they do a survey, I suppose, uh, on the streets or whatever, people who travel, and they said, you've reached six and a half million people 
uh, in the time that we've been doing the campaigns. And that's twice the number of people who attend church on a regular basis in the UK. Wow. Is there a follow-up that, that if they go to the website, um, they can find out more? Absolutely, yes. The QuoteJesus.com has some of the scriptures. It's a very simple website. But what I believe that the Lord was doing in all of this was the silent witness. God's Holy Spirit speaks to people when they see the words on the buses. And we've got testimonies to that. Give you one for example. A man who's been struggling with alcoholism for 10 years and wanting to give his life to the Lord was in a church at his lunch hour in the city of London where he went just to pray on his own, came out the church and he saw this, today you'll be with me in paradise. And it just clicked with him and he gave his life to the Lord that day and he and overcome the alcohol. <laughs> how, did, how did you go from being in the music business to getting billboards on buses and starting a Christian television network? Yeah, it's easy, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it, many years. Um, mm. But the thing is that reading the words of God for myself, I was 21 when I first started to read the Bible. It took me two and a quarter years because I'm dyslexic. And what got you started reading? Um, when I made a prayer to the Lord, because I, 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 my dad was dead and I was in the music industry, which I loved. I played with some famous people. I worked for the Beatles management company, I auditioned the Bee Gees when they first came to England. I was a record producer, musician, but I was always being propositioned by homosexuals in, in mm. high places. And I wasn't willing to give in to that. So I, I was praying, Lord, if you are there, if there is a God, and I can't talk to my earthly dad because he's dead. I said, I love this business, music, but I can't stay in it. And, um, and then it, I started to read the Bible. People were talking to me from different religions, sex and things like that. But I read the Bible for myself. That was the key. I didn't have anybody influencing me. And that's how I came to find out about Israel being an important point. I mean, when I went to people in the church, they told me to get lost, you know, when I showed them the scriptures in Romans, hmm. etc. So it's a the, long journey, but, but the I Bible just... The Bible is a unique book. It's the only one that the author will actually sit down with you and yes. explain it to you. Exactly. And uh, you, what, what verse got you to say, I'm, I'm now going to leave my old life, I'm going to be a Christian? It took many years for, it wasn't a one particular verse, Gordon. It, it was the fact is that for me, prophecy stood out. When I started to read and I read from Genesis, it was hard, it was tough going, because I'm all the these and thous and the bigets and all, all the genealogies. Really yeah. yeah, but it spoke to me and I mm. love Proverbs. It helped me to be wise in my business dealings. And in fact, it stopped me from being, you know, trying to be a millionaire mm. at the cost of just other people, you know, and I started to do things in a godly way, which was being giving a good deal. And I ended up making more money than I thought I could ever do. But I was applying biblical principles. I've made mistakes. We all have. All have. But I tell you what, there's nothing more powerful than the words of God. And to get the quotes of Jesus back on in front of people's faces. And it's not just the buses. The Lord was showing me to do t television ads radio ads, underground, overground, hoardings, whatever. We need to do this across the world, not just in London, because uh -huh. the time is coming soon when the Lord is returning. And that's one of the scriptures I had as well, Gordon. I am coming soon. And he even got on the BBC. They picked that bus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, the word of the Lord, it never returns void. If you want to learn more about the Quote Jesus campaign or Revelation TV, all you have to do is go to our website, cbn.com, and we'll have a link for you. We also have a web exclusive interview with Howard on our Facebook page. To watch that, just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Well, up next, we'll bring it on with your email questions. Stay with us. And welcome back. It's time to bring it on with your email questions. And we're going to start with this one from Lionel. He says, I'm from South Africa, and I try not to miss your program. My question is, does God only hear the outcry of certain people and the outcry of others is disregarded? My family and I had to close our business twice. And the more I seek God, the bigger our problems got. My heart and soul are ripped to pieces. 
Uh, Lionel, God's no respecter of persons. Uh, what he's done for others, he will absolutely do for you. Uh, all the promises of God are yes and amen for those who are in Christ Jesus. If your heart and soul have been ripped to pieces, uh, I would encourage you to just spend time with the Lord in his presence, uh, times of refreshing. And he's the one that's got a lot of ideas, and he'll tell you good things, uh, just as he did with Howard Condor, the guest we just had. He regularly sets aside, Lord, what do you want me to do this year? Uh, and so that's a good prayer to pray. What do you want me to do? Um, tell me something to do and let, you know, let me be part of your plan. Uh, those are great prayers and he will answer those prayers for you. Uh, but you need to be restored. If you're going through life saying you're ripped to pieces, just spend time with him, uh, lay aside uh, the concerns that you have, just spend time to him and wait for him. Wait on the Lord. Amen. Here's one from Scott. He says, I was thinking about what it says in Hebrews 6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partaker, par partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Does this mean that if I've fallen back into old habits that there's no more hope for me and that I'm going to hell? Um, Scott, that verse, Martin Luther, just because of that verse, didn't want to include the book of Hebrews in his German translation. Uh, he finally got persuaded to, to add it in. That, that verse, I don't think you should make a whole doctrine out of that one. Uh, I, I think it's talking about you completely leave the faith and you start to say, Jesus is not the Savior, He's not the Messiah. Um, that, that complete turn away uh, from God. It's not talking about sin. And look at David. Uh, David prayed, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And he had committed some horrible sins. He had murdered the husband of Bathsheba. He had slept with her and conceived out of wedlock. It was adultery, uh, and he, he said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. So you read that and you go, he hadn't lost his salvation, mm -hmm. which I, th I find incredible, but he had lost his joy. Uh, so let righteousness, peace, and joy be yours in the Holy Spirit, realizing that he will always forgive us. If we will confess, he will be faithful to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's another word from Hebrews. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword.